So uh, I'll tell you what, Lee, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, okay. Well, uh, well, first of all, I got to wish you a happy new year. I think this is the first time, although it was only virtually, this is the first time we're seeing each other this year. So happy new year to you. Yeah, happy new year to you too. And, uh, and it's good that the book, and it's good to get a chance to talk about the book. Um, many, it was on the Christmas lists of many people that I knew and I gave some as gifts too. So it's great to be able to connect after all of that and, and, and talk about the book a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I think, you know, a lot of people have wanted to get it and, um, uh, I'm, I'm glad that we're doing new events in 2023 just to extend the life of the book and interest in the issues we've talked about. Cause as you and I both know, these issues are, they're not just, you know, important when the book comes out, they're important in an ongoing way, especially the equity issue that I think we're going to, we should be hearing a lot about in the mayoral primary race. You know, I agree. And, you know, and, and, and I guess that's a good point uh, to sort of jump into some questions. I guess you question me, I'll question you. Yeah. yeah. Um, Your questions are going to be tougher than mine, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> we'll see, right? It depends. I'm yeah. just throwing, I'm just throwing softballs and, <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, you know, if if, uh, if I you know run downstairs and get some wine, you know, maybe uh, <laughs> might, might toughen up a little bit. Huh. Um, so 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 tell us why. Talk a bit about why uh, you're right, right, why you've written a book, and why now? Because the timing of it is kind of interesting. It's more than a compilation of columns. Uh, it, it really is a a look at the last ten years in the city, but it's positioned forward forward uh to give us a sense of what those issues are right now i mean and what they mean right now talk about yeah. that a little bit. thank you that's well put well you know i had done two previous books with the university of chicago press each one a collection of columns that covered a 10-year period one uh, why architecture matters covered the 1990s another uh terror and wonder um covered the first decade of the 21st century so when I left the Tribune two years ago, uh, I figured that it would be worthwhile to kind of complete the trilogy, as it were, with a new collection that covered the teens and the first year or so of, uh, the, of the 20s. This trilogy does not have any characters named Frodo or Gandalf. Uh, uh, however, um, there are certain characters uh, who have repeat performances like Jeannie Gang or Carol Ross Barney. And the idea really was to, as you say, um, not just republish these columns, but to put a new spin on them by organizing them thematically and tying a big bow around them, which is the title of the book, Who is the City For?, and that really, that really sums up the book's focus on an issue, equity, um, that wasn't being talked about a lot in architectural circles in, say, the 1980s, when it was all about, you know, um, getting away from the steel and glass boxes of our friend Mies van der Rohe, the designer of the Farnsworth House, and um, incorporating history and irony and wit and ornament, uh, things championed by the Chicago Seven, uh, rebels who revolted against against Mies van der Rohe. Mm -hmm. So it's a so it's a book that reflects a different time, uh, and that's evident very much in its title and and a lot of the articles that I put put in the book. You know, to that end, you know, the architecture criticism game has changed uh, at least locally. I mean, I'm finding locally, maybe not so much in some other cities, uh, where you're absolutely right. It has gone from. Um, and the readers are, are calling for this, but luckily, you know, critics are driving this. It's really gone from a kind of a, a you know, beauty contest sort of insular way of describing architecture to the masses to really figuring out how a city works uh, as an organism and as the title of the book says, uh, uh, who the city works for and, and, and who it doesn't work for. Uh, all that becomes part of the, of the mix as well. Well, this is something, this is why when the editors uh, at the University of Chicago Press said, hey, we need some photographs. This is why I said, hey, let's get Lee Bay on the project because mm -hmm. you know, you are um, a terrific photographer, a terrific architecture critic. And I knew that both of us had done projects in the past 
long before the field moved in this direction that dealt with the issue of equity. You wrote this tremendous um, ongoing series of articles, like practically one a day in the 90s about Bronzeville that brought that important historical neighborhood to the public's attention. And I want to point out that, right, Congress just approved, what was it, national designation for Bronzeville? You know the, you know the exact stuff. Yeah, you know, I've forgotten what it is. Well, yeah, it, it has a, a new designation, you know, and, um, you know, that puts it on the map a little bit more, uh, uh, which is great. Great news. Right. And then, of course, I had done um, a series on the Chicago lakefront in 1998, which one of the stories in the series pointed out the inequity between the North lakefront and the South lakefront, the North lakefront, which was bordered by the mostly white and affluent Lincoln Park neighborhood, had all sorts of acreage, amenities, and easy access. Uh, the South Side lakefront, um, South McCormick Place, bordered by uh, mostly poor and black neighborhoods, had less acreage, far fewer amenities, uh, and terrible access from the neighborhoods to the West. So, I mean, it was natural, I think, that we would work together um, on this project. You know, I think it, so I, I think in Chicago, you know, we've evolved this type of criticism that, um, as you say, doesn't just judge buildings and urban designs by how they look. I mean, we we do look at that. That's important. That's why we're here. I mean, design is one of the things that distinguishes what we do and, and, and judgments about design distinguish those things. But we don't restrict ourselves simply to aesthetic issues. And I think you know, long before Michael Kimmelman at the New York Times jumped on this bandwagon and everyone started talking about architecture as a social art, we were doing it like 30 years ago, man. So, <laughs> you know, um, and that continues to the present day. And I think that that's influenced the dialogue in Chicago in a very positive way. You know, you mentioned the characters in your book. Uh, you, well, you mentioned the characters that aren't in the trilogy, but, uh, but in this latest book, it's quite a cast of characters. It's Donald Trump. It's it's uh, it's President Obama. It's almost devil in the white city with all these kind of historic, <laughs> without a murder, dare I say, uh, right. with all these historic figures kind of all in the stew sw swimming around. Um, talk about that a bit, uh, especially the uh, the Donald Trump piece, because as we've talked in the past, and you know, and again, uh, those who are listening, really, you really should get the book because it it, it as we've as, as we've mentioned. Well, the things that we knew, that we know and see about Donald Trump today and over the past four years, you could see more than glimpses of it in, in Blair's writing about Trump Tower. Uh, tell us more about that. Well, the the first two essays or the first three essays in the book are about Trump. And the first two of those are about the giant sign he erected uh, on his uh, otherwise pretty handsome Chicago skyscraper. Um, for me, it was like dealing with Trump was like a foretaste of what the havoc he was going to wreak when he became president. And knowing someone who is president and who's a total nutcase narcissist is just frightening. Um, Trump, you know, when Trump was um, building his tower, he wanted a good review from me. So as he put it, he sucked up to me for like seven or eight years, uh, writing me fawning letters. And, you know, I mean, I have a great collection of Trump, uh, Trump obelia uh, that will someday be worth a lot of money uh, with his, you know, giant skyscraper size signatures on these letters, even on Trump stationery with the raised gold letters that say Trump. Um, anyway, so, but, you know, once um, I criticized the, um, sign he put on the bottom of his skyscraper uh, along the Chicago River, across from the Chicago Riverwalk. Uh, you know, the sign is half as roughly half as long as a football field. Letters are 20 feet high. It's really the ultimate uh, narcissistic exercise. Once that happened, I was a third rate critic. He thought I had gotten fired from my job when in fact I was on a fellowship uh, somewhere out east. And, you know, and like, I'm just minding my own business and all this stuff is coming out on the Today Show that like, I'm a third rate critic and, you know, all of a sudden a Twitter war breaks out and Trump is saying, you know, I'm a sucker and, you know, I mean, 
I sort of feel like a canary in the coal mine when it comes to his demonization of the press, enemies of the people. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, it was just the strangest experience, Lee. Um, I would not wish it on anybody, but it does, it is a, it is a pretty good story. I have to, I have to admit. Well, it certainly is. And, uh, you know, those who are, might, might be a little bit younger, uh, you know, you know, it, it, you know, you, you had to have been there to see how popular Trump was at this time. Right. Uh, uh, you know, I remember as we discussed, you know, I was working at SOM, uh, when the demolition began of the Sun-Times building, breaking my heart, uh, yep. for the, uh, for the building to be built. And, um, and Trump came to that, and he and his, and his eyeball children. And um, I took pictures of it. I should, I should send you some if, if it's not too traumatizing for the two of us. But, you know, the whole intersection of Wacker and Wabash was just filled with people. They wanted to, you know, clamor to get at this guy. And I remember thinking, you know, in a good way, uh, and, and I remember thinking, uh, as I've said before, I, I really thought that he would have been left back in the 80s, you know, a relic of the 80s. <laughs> You know, along with you know, uh, sod nine hundreds and lifestyle of the rich and famous, and and I mean, there he was, the height of his, the height of his, of his, of his popularity. Well, an early height of his popularity. He, we'd have seen more of that later. So, well, well, you know, it shows. I mean, the his ability to harness the media, as you witnessed, yeah. became a key element in his presidential campaign. I mean, he got all that free advertising when you know CNN and Fox would cover his speeches ad nauseum. But I just want to point out that the like people ask me about the sign, and it's like, why did you, uh, you know, hammer away at this sign? Well, I mean, it goes to the issue of the book. Who is the city for? In other words, who is the riverfront for? Is it is it uh, like a um, a place where Donald Trump can display his vanity and narcissism with a giant sign that is a blight? Uh, a visual blight on the Riverwalk, or you know, or a place that people can give the flip the bird to uh, as they walk by, or should it be a less commercialized zone um, that's really you know emphasizes its civic quality rather than its commercial quality? And I mean, one of the things that I think separates this book from typical collections of columns is that there are postscripts, things in the book that bring the story up to the present. So the postscripts for the Trump uh, columns show that Rahm Emanuel uh, got into this whole thing. Uh, and ultimately he had the city council pass the legislation that restricted the size and placement of future signs along the Riverwalk. Um, Trump unfortunately got to keep his, there was nothing the city could do to get rid of it. Um, but, uh, the point is that, you know, the city understood the question, who is the river walk for, and said to itself via Rahm and the city council, we're not going to let, we're not going to have future um, incidents like this where, you know, someone just splashes their name, you know, XXXL uh, over, uh, you know, hanging over the river walk and blighting this public space. Uh, I know there will be some people in the crowd who will say, well, the Chicago Tribune has a sign along the river walk, you know, and that even uh, is still there, but, or a new version of it in the, in the condo version of Tribune Tower. But I should point out that that sign is like about one third the size in square footage of Trump's sign. And it's also far further back from the river than Trump's, which is like right up along the river. And, and so it's, you know, just right in your face. Um, so, I mean, those are the kind of distinctions that the that the city sign ordinance addressed. But I mean, that's the key. The, the essay in this new context isn't just about Trump. It's about the deeper question of who are public spaces for and how should the city regulate buildings and open spaces and signage along those public spaces. You know, and it, and it tilts in the right direction uh, with uh, the Riverwalk being completed uh, in the years after the sign. And, of course, Carol Ross Barney winning last month uh, in December the uh, AIA gold medal. Carol Ross Barney, the architect, Chicago architect who, uh, who uh, uh, designed the portions of the Riverwalk that we're, that we're talking about. Um, you, had some, you had some pretty interesting experiences photographing the Trump sign. Do you want to tell the... Uh, uh, 
the viewers about those because I think those are those kind of speak to some the ways many people in Chicago feel about the Trump sign. Well, yeah. So the so the photograph that you see in the book is 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 um is me using what little I'm six one, so I'm a little a little tall, and and I'm shooting over people uh, who are on the the south side of the river, uh, and they're and you know it's a crowded day. One of the last photographs I shot. There you go. Uh, and um, and what you can't tell is that you know people are like people ask me why are you shooting the sign? They knew, and I said, well, you know, it's for for a book. And people were like they're putting their, their middle finger up, uh, you know, as as as, as is custom. You know, you know, don't you know? I was kind of shooting around them, you know, and got a few snaps without the tips of people's middle fingers in it. But you know, but it, but it, but it really, you know, it, it really raises people's hackles. People really hate that sign, which is um, the irony of it all. Because uh, I think, as you mentioned in the book, uh, you know, he thought it was going to be like the Hollywood sign, right? Yeah, the Hollywood sign. It's going to be like the Hollywood sign. Everyone's going to love it, and people say it's classy, classy, very classy <laughs> sign. And I mean, you know, it it turned out to be the perfect platform for opponents of him and his administration to hold, you know, to hold dem anti-Trump demonstrations. So it was, you know, his prediction was completely off base. And now, you know, the building is, I mean, it, it leasing rates in that building have dropped because of its association with Trump. And Skidmore, the architectural firm that you work for, like doesn't even refer to it, the commission as the Trump Tower. What do they call it? 401 North Wabash or something yeah. like that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So you know, every, everybody, everyone wants to remove the, the stink of uh, of Trump off them, uh, mm -hmm. not without bad reason. I think. So, 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 let me ask. Um, so you know, twenty eight years in the architecture business. Well, first of all, I've got to ask: Do you miss it? Because after you left, well, you know, things were popping on the architecture beating the field while you were there. Obviously, you you, you literally stepped off a moving train. But uh, but there's a lot of stuff happening. You know the red line, Soldier Field. Um, you know the Sunday that we're uh, having this conversation, uh, the utter madness of, uh, of 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 Soldier Field and One Central. Um, uh, what do you think about that? First of all, I mean, and, and just to bring everyone up to speed. So obviously, as you know, everyone knows. Uh, so uh, the the mayor, Mayor Lightfoot, wants to make Soldier Field a better home to keep the Bears. The Bears are saying, "Listen, at least for now, we're in Arlington Heights. That's where we're headed." You know, uh, you know, shine on and be free. You know, do what you want to do. So her stadium consultant is a guy, Bob Dunn, who just coincidentally, this is this is as Chicago as, as anything, wants to develop a thing called One Central right across the metro tracks to the west from Soldier Field. And part of that is this um, transportation center that essentially wants the, the public to, to own at some point. Uh, yeah, own and pay for. Pay for, exactly. <laughs> and um, and uh, and so now, uh, as seen uh, in renderings uh, and videos released this weekend, um, he's talking about the future of Soldier Field, but he begins it by talking about One Central in this yeah. video. The what a surprise! <laughs> exactly right, right. So it's like if you want this, you got to get this. But anyway, a lot of stuff happening. Where are we now, architecturally in the city, in terms of what's being planned? What do you like? What do you don't like? Uh, what don't you like? I should say. Uh, well, what I like is that the Chicago Sun-Times decided to jump into the void that the Chicago Tribune left by not replacing me. Mm -hmm. And they asked you to come back as architecture critic. Uh, you had been the architecture critic in the 90s, right? And uh, before you went to... Uh, to the dark side and work for daily. And uh, I'm just kidding about that, of course. Um, and I mean, you know, it's great that there's still a voice in Chicago um, writing about architecture as you do. And I think that that really, that emphasis became clear in a very important way in the just concluded debate over city council funding for the red line extension mm -hmm. south of 95th street you wrote superb editorials and they really were superb um, talking about why this uh extension was absolutely necessity an absolute necessity for the far south side and you pointed out in those editorials why it was absurd 
and totally inequitable that uh, several suburbs, Wilmette, Evanston, Skokie, Oak Park, Cicero, and River Forest? Uh, Forest Park, right next to River Forest. Thank yeah. you. All have CTA service and the far south side does not. Mm -hmm. I mean, what? Like crazy, right? Jeez. So thank goodness that you were there keeping everybody honest and accountable because that, if that, if the city council had not authorized TIF funding for that project, it would have been a freaking travesty. And 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 freaking is the is the nice word that I'm using. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, this goes back to the issue the issue of how people live and uh, what architecture critics should write about. And you and I both agree that you know, we're not just looking at buildings as objects, even though we love objects, like the Farnsworth house uh, mm -hmm. that are extraordinarily beautiful and that command our attention because of the, just the sheer virtuosity of an architect like Mies van der Rohe. Um, but in other words, we agree that infrastructure and, you know, things like that, that make up the public realm are an essential part of of what it means to build an equitable city. And if I live on the south, far south side of Chicago and I don't have transit access, which is the current case, it's gonna take me half an hour longer to get downtown. It's gonna be harder to get to school, uh, you know, if I'm that age. And it's gonna be bad for the for air pollution because I'm gonna be driving instead of taking transit. I mean, you, you know, you can just go on and on and on. So this really gets to a key theme in the book, which is that equity isn't just um, investing in neighborhoods that have historically been the victim of discrimination and disinvestment. I mean, that's an essential part of it, but it's not the only part. Um, in the book, I try to borrow uh, from the financial meaning of the word equity, or rather it's plural, equities, as in stocks, things we share, and the whole point here is we're talking about the environment that we share, the public realm. And when, you know, it, it's essential for the quality of life of people in the city to have parks that are equitable, transit that's equitable, housing that's equitable. In other words, to have opportunities for affordable housing and just communities where you want to live, raise a family, um, send your kids to school. Though they're obviously these are complex issues and you can't solve them by buildings alone, but buildings are an essential part. Uh, buildings and infrastructure are an essential part of these things. And I, I think that's why, um, in the, you know, again, in the current scene, uh, I'm glad that you're there. Um, I also hope that you're going to be there, that, that I think it's great that even though you're writing a once a month column on architecture, you're weighing in, in those unsigned editorials for the Sun Times that clearly have a Lee Bay that clearly are written by Lee Bay. Um, you're supposed to know, right? You're not supposed I'm, to know. Well, yeah, but I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for a Sun Times editorial that says Lee Bay's column was brilliant, and and the Sun Times, as an institution, thinks that we should do exactly what Lee Bay recommended in his in his latest critique. I, I'm, I think you know. Oh, it's coming! It's coming! As, I, as I've told you before, Alan Temko, the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, a friend of Myron Goldsmith, by the way, who worked on the Farnsworth House, uh, actually did stuff like that, pulled stuff like that in the 1960s when ethics rules were very different and looser, at least in San Francisco, but it had great effect. Um, hey, can I can I mention one thing about the Farnsworth House? Because um, there's an essay about the Farnsworth House in the book. And... Um, People might be saying, the Farnsworth House? What is the Farnsworth House doing in a book called Who is the City For? I mean, there's like seemingly no equity issues uh, that are, um, you know, related to a house built for a, a white woman who is a nephrologist. It's a vacation home. It's like, you know, 60 or 70 miles outside the city of Chicago. What kind of equity are we talking about here? Well, I mean, the issue is gender equity. In other words, and it goes to this, the issue of equity in historic preservation. 
And what does that mean? Well, when we save buildings, we're not just saving the buildings, we're saving the narratives and the stories that go along with those buildings. So, you know, for so many years, it was just the Farnsworth house by Mies van der Rohe. And, oh yeah, this woman, Edith Farnsworth, you know, like she commissioned the house and she and Mies had a big court battle, but we really just cared about the Farnsworth house. And then there was this wonderful exhibition at the Farnsworth house, the Edith Farnsworth house that it's now known, um, which foregrounded her role as the client, the patron, and even um, put replicas of her furniture in the house, kind of bringing her back into the physical presence of the house and the narrative. And so, you know, so there's gender equity. There's all kinds of equity. Uh, I mean, there's transit equity, there's park equity, um, you know, you name it. And there's obviously um, issues about race and class in historic preservation. One of the essays uh, is about the house of Emma Till, uh, the uh, teenage uh, kid from Chicago who was murdered in Mississippi and his mother um, showed his casket uh, open to show the horrors uh, that had been inflicted on him and helped to spark the civil rights movement. And so, you know, one of the essays in the book deals with the fact that this building, Emma Till's house, almost slipped through the cracks. Some developer bought it. He didn't know it was Emma Till's house. He was going to do God knows what with it. And, you know, fortunately it was caught and the building was landmarked and it may be a museum. But I, I think the, the thing that's interesting that I just want to point out to the viewers here is that um, is the cover of the book, because in some ways you can judge a book, or at least this book, by its cover. Mm -hmm. um, on the cover is Lee's wonderful shot of the bean in Millennium Park. And on the back, well, it's hard to see, but um, behind these blurbs is Lee's photo of the Emmett Till house. And interestingly, in the middle of the book is a red spine, which suggests redlining, the systematic process by which um, loans, uh, credit, insurance, and other things were denied to African-American families historically, uh, stunting their opportunities for growth, economic growth, intergener uh, intergenerational wealth, and other things. And um, again, this deals with uh, the, the, the stories that we tell through historic preservation. And Long, long story short, that's why the Farnsworth House is in the book, because it's such an iconic structure. And the issues related to gender equity with the Farnsworth House were, you know, critical enough to put in the book. You know, and, and very, you know, very good points. I mean, and, and uh, Farnsworth and Till uh, and the Till House, you know, getting those histories um, right and getting them um, uh, revisited, if you will, you know, yeah. you wants to correct the record of what we know about these individuals. I mean, you know, you hear for years, for decades, that maybe maybe Edith Farnsworth had a thing for me, and maybe that was part of what was going on. And right. then you read a little bit more about our history, and you say that's probably unlikely. Let's just say, right? And yeah. uh, and 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 and, and, it, and it also does much, which is what it should do, uh, correcting the history to separate her story from his. You know, where they meet to tell that story. But also, this was an accomplished woman. You know, classical music, uh, you know, all kinds. I mean, a, a fully formed and accomplished woman long before she ever set eyes on on, on, on me. And, um, and and it's good to be able to have that story told as we tell the, 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 the story of the house. And, and certainly with the case of the of the, till, of the Till house, you know, that's where she was living, maybe till when she made that, that, that fraught decision um, right. to, to essentially uh, do this and essentially change the um, uh, history of the nation. Uh, so very yeah. good to keep that in there, to put that in there. I mean, these things are far from, um, well, I, I think these narratives complicate and enrich our understanding of these, of these buildings. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's what's so interesting about historic preservation. I mean, there are essays in the book which deal with just straight out saves, you know, like, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Unity Temple or Roby House. 
I mean, well, the University of Chicago at one point, of course, did want to tear down the Roman House. But in other words, you know, we've gone, I think, beyond the travails and um, struggles that followed the destruction of Pennsylvania Station in the 1960s and the Chicago Stock Exchange in the early 1970s, where we were struggling just to save landmark buildings, you know, conventional like history book buildings. I mean, that's still important. Yes. And I, I don't think we should ever uh, relegate that, you know, just because it does, doesn't necessarily have to do with social justice questions. I mean, these buildings are, are great works of the building art, Baukunst, as Mies uh, talked about, and um, they should be preserved, you know, for that reason alone. And yet we now have new layers uh, of understanding and richer, and these things enrich our understanding of, of, of these buildings. And, you know, it's a lot like what you did in your book, Southern Exposure, where, you know, Emma Till's house in particular, I mean, you know, you went out and looked at say Pride Cleaners, you know, this George Jetson style building that's fabulous and, and other examples of, of overlooked work on the South side. And, you know, we, I mean, this is what we do. We try to open people's eyes, right? Um, Cause you know, people are going about their daily lives. They're trying to work, they're doing whatever. And, you know, we, we are in the privileged, truly privileged position of getting paid to go out and, you know, be flanners and check out you know, what's, you know, what's there on that street corner. Oh my God, there's, you know, at the corner of, uh, you know, um, on Chicago in, you know, on the, on the far West side on Chicago Avenue, here's this dazzling art deco Laramie state bank building, you know, that you took a, a photograph of actually, I mean, um, I think you've got that photograph. Should you want to, should we go to, uh, so that's a good segue. We didn't plan this, honestly, but uh, I love your photo of that uh, building. You want to, do you have it? Uh, you want to call it up? Uh, let me call it up. And, and as we do, you know, so Larry State Bank, of course, uh, is being looked at as part of, as being, um, as part of the Mayor's Invest Southwest Reinvestment Program. Now we have a mayoral election coming up in a few months, a couple of months, three months, four months. And you mentioned in the book, and of course, much of your writing, you know, how much architecture is also an act of politics in some way, what gets preserved, what gets built, what doesn't get built. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts as the, as the mayor's election comes up? Good question. Um, I, um, if I were Lori Lightfoot, I'd be nervous. Mm -hmm. um, I think despite Lori, Lori Lightfoot has done a lot of things that are very, that could turn out to be very significant and very important in the long term for the city of Chicago. One of those things is Invest Southwest. And this is a program for those who aren't familiar with it that seeks to rebuild commercial quarters in 10 neighborhoods on the south and west sides, among them Englewood, Austin, um, and, and others. And uh, you know, what we're seeing, this is the Laramie State Bank building in Austin that we've talked about. Gorgeous building, mm -hmm. uh, an Art Deco landmark. And um, it would be a travesty if a building like this was lost. And instead, um, Maurice Cox, the very talented planning commissioner, is has formed this program where um, buildings like this would be saved, uh, and turned into retail and cultural use. There would be a new apartment uh, building, a modern building just to the west of this on Chicago Avenue. Um, and what's interestingly is that the program has amassed $2.2 billion in private, public, and philanthropic investment. Um, and I mean, you know, so many people had written off these neighborhoods. Oh, there's their wasteland. There's nothing there. Oh, no one will ever invest in them. Baloney. I mean, th the problem for Lightfoot is that only now is, you know, have we had a few groundbreakings and um, construction really isn't underway in any big, big way. So, you know, it's hard to sell voters on a rendering, mm -hmm. something they can't touch. 
Um, but the thing is that they can still see through your photograph the beauty of this building. And I think it's it's worth, I mean, one of the things that I am, I, I have a hunch that the readers are curious about is, or the, the, the viewers here, is how you shot this building. You know, what did you do to make it come alive? Because it, it it's not a conventional uh, beauty shot. Uh, you know, that would appear in an architectural magazine. So what did you do, especially in black and white, to, to animate this building? Well, uh, you know, a couple of things. One is that I, I you know, I, I wanted to pick this kind of odd angle rather than, than shoot the building, you know, face on uh, mm -hmm. or from the um, or from the corner that's to the north to the southeast, which would mean, which would mean shooting across the intersection. There's a, something about, um, the way the building looked in this angle that reminded me of, you know, photography of, you know, of, of, of uh, Greek temples, um, uh, Egyptian temples, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, and of course, using it in black and white. Now, the, the, build, the, the book being printed in black and white, um, you know, had, uh, was helpful in terms of me thinking of these, how to shoot these buildings that, you know, you have to then use shadow and form because you don't, you don't have color uh, to begin to tell the story of the building. Um, but I want, but I thought this angle would be interesting enough to hold the eye so you, you first see the beauty of the building uh, that came with it when it was built in 1929. And then as the eye lingers, uh, you get to see what's happened in the, the 90 years since, right? You can see the, uh, the, the, you know, the dilapidation to the, to the windows in the upper left there and, mm -hmm. you know, at the bottom left there, the deli shop that was once there, and of course the wear and the tear. And I think so. Um, that, that's and I thought that angle would kind of bring that out, would make it strange enough to the eye to make the eye linger there enough to to allow you to see these kind of things. Yeah, and you shot the building in the sun, clearly, right? I did. I, I waited until uh, this is still summertime, so it must be about you know five o'clock, six o'clock. So the sun is shining from the west, so it's kind of behind me. Oh, uh, in a way, uh, but in a way that lights up the building. Right, and so that angle also produced the shadows of the leaves. Um, uh, those are that's a tree, right, on the far left. Exactly, a tree, and then some vines growing on the building uh, as as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, no, I love that shot, and I I think it really manages um, to just you know show the just the you know how this building is such a gem and a gem and. Uh, how it could be the cornerstone of, you know, a revitalized uh, neighborhood in Austin. Mm -hmm. uh, are there others you want to share? Uh, well, this is this is one. This is um, looks like it could be the lost facade to the Field Museum or something. But this is actually Old Cook County Hospital, and um, uh, which is obviously in the in the book. Uh, which you know. For many of us who were born here, born here in Chicago and passed it up or covered crime stories out of here, you know, for most of its existence, Cook County Hospital was this dreary looking place. And when the new county hospital was built uh, and, you know, the question became what to do with this, you know, tear it down, you know, what, what is it really? And uh, the building hung on long enough, thank God, uh, for it to be restored. And what you see is that it really is a beautiful building with rich details. Um, it, looks like a, it looks like a palace, right? It, it really does. It, it really does. And, and you know, and, and you know, these, these are the kind of things that once they're covered in grime and we turn a civic eye away from them, uh, they run the risk of being lost. But when we save them, uh, as, as, as the book points out, I mean, what a treasure this is. So, you know, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a hotel, uh, it's a food emporium, although I, th although I think the, the food court inside may have, either be closed or maybe on its way out. Um, but when I took these photographs, there were people getting married uh, here in front. Well, they were, they, were, they were taking pictures from a wedding, wedding pictures outside the building. I had to shave them off because I didn't want to get them in a shot and have them chase me down for any uh, any royalties or anything. But that speaks to the, you know, no one who had gotten married would have wanted, you know, 30 years ago, no one who, who, who had just gotten married would have ever thought about taking their picture in front of this building, having their picture taken from this building. But now it's 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 such beauty of such beauty. That's what people are doing. Yeah, I mean, I I love the the frame here because it 
it captures it isn't a detail shot but it captures so much detail including those little cherubs yeah. in the uh the upper uh corners as well as all the um you know the beauty of the fluted columns and and um the lights above the entrance um i mean it it i i think this was a, a fascinating pairing with the essay that I wrote, just because, you know, again, the essay talked about how um, Cook County Hospital was kind of like the Ellis Island of Chicago. All these people who didn't have a lot of money, you know, went there um, to uh, for their medical care. And there were also tremendous um, medical advances made there. I mean, I think the first blood bank yeah. uh, or pioneering blood bank uh, work was done at Cook County Hospital. And this was, again, you know, a narrative that uh, was far easier to preserve with the building itself, mm -hmm. you know, still around. So, I mean, again, this building um, spoke to the issue of equity in historic preservation because this was, a you know, this wasn't like, even though it looks a little bit like the Field Museum, it's not on the lakefront, it's on the west side. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, um, you know, has this kind of storied history, though. You know, it was a, you know, so many movies were shot there. The Fugitive, ER. Uh, and it, I mean, that's like, it's interesting that that media is also part of the story and memory, right? That like, you know, we remember these things. Like, you know, you remember Harrison Ford darting through the, <laughs> you know, the corridors of this building as he tries to escape from Tommy Lee Jones and the people who are trying to frame him for, uh, you know, for supposedly killing his wife. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, there's, there's a great shot with him walking across Harrison into the building and the building, because, you know, at the time the building was obviously still a hospital, still down on its heels in terms of looks. The building looks like it's just foreboding. It's like he's going into what the hell is he going into? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and now you see what's there. The other thing about this photograph that I, that I like this photographer is that, you know, I bet you natives, me included, never knew there was that much architectural detail in this building. I was shocked looking through the viewfinder to see, oh, yeah. see what, what was there. I mean, just the, the detail of what's there. And it goes to show, as you just pointed out, you know, here's a building that's on a largely immigrant and soon to be African-American and immigrant west side of Chicago. Um, and look at the architecture that they devoted to healthcare. They put it on par. Uh, with museums and banks and other things, which tells you something about, I mean, this, this isn't Northwestern, right? This isn't uh, old Michael Reese. Um, uh, you know, this is, this is, this is the hospital for, for the indigent, you know, for the most part. And right. look, at the, look at the love and care and design that they put into this. You can, yeah. look at the, you, can, you can look at this photograph or the building itself, you know, for a half hour and still pick out details. Yeah, I think that's really well put. It's, uh, it, it elevates, it it tells people who are walking in those doors, we care about you. You know, we you're our you're our brother, you're our sister, you're not some, you know, poor wretch who we look down upon. This is a palace of healing. And you know, we and we take that seriously. You have dignity here. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I think the photograph captures that really beautifully. What else uh, you want to show us, Mr. Bay? Well, let's see. Uh, your uh, essay, your, your writing on the, um, the uh, library and housing uh, mix that uh, Rahm Emanuel uh, uh, kind of created. How many of these things are there around the city? There are five? Uh, this well, there's, is Italy, but where's, where's, there's five of them. Right? There's, uh, I think, four. There's four. three. This one is in Little Italy. Then there's two more on the north and northwest side, and then there's one on the far south side. But this this is a good place, I think, um, for me to ask you about the approach you took uh, on this photography, um, or, or, or you know, photographing this book um, with people. Um, why is that guy in the bicycle in the frame? In other words, like, you know, the architects, like if the architects were submitting this to architectural record for publication, they would have like waited for that guy to disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, but you put him in. Uh, so why is he there? 
You know, he's he's here uh, because it it shows. You know, he's looking at the building as he goes by. You can see there's a uh, there's a person in the front of the building. Uh, there's bikes in front of it. You can it, it helps position the building as kind of a center of activity in the in the community uh, that isn't just sort of maroon there. So it was just a stroke of luck that he that he looked at the building uh, as he drove by because it helps focus the reader's attention uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to the to the structure. Uh, yeah. had, he, had he been looking ahead, I probably would have picked another another image. Uh, I, I think I think that there's this is a really skillfully composed frame because this is a very big building and it would be very hard to shoot it from you know all the way across the street at an angle which try to capture the whole thing so you've captured the essence of this building um it, you know if the viewers look at it they can see the low-rise chicago public library the one-story transparent um, pro, um pavilion in the foreground and above that is uh about five or six stories of public housing. And this is a very unique combination um, combining a public library with public housing. The idea being that, you know, you could save construction costs by building the two together. And also you could achieve the purpose, at least in theory, of integrating public housing residents into society, which is different from isolating them, which is what the big housing projects like the Robert Taylor homes used to do. So, I mean, you know, what's fascinating to me is just in this, in this frame, you've captured all that, you know, and you've, and you've captured the fact that this building is eye-catching enough that the guy on the bike would look at it and you didn't get sued because this guy's face is. <laughs> I can see it's mine, right? So you're not, you're, yeah. You're not dealing, you're not robbing his privacy. You're not, you know, disturbing his privacy, right? Indeed, indeed. And you know, and I, I and you know, and I tried shooting the whole building. I have a, a, um, an angle, uh, a lens that's wide enough to shoot the whole building. But it just, you know, it, I kept thinking, well, it's the essence is what you're looking for. And you're not looking to tell the whole story. You're looking to tell the essence, and the essence is right here at this at this entrance where all those those pieces begin to come together. Yeah, and again, the sunlight, you know, conveys even though you don't have blue skies in the background. Although we can. Uh, surmise that it's blue skies exactly. that this the brilliant sunshine really lends an air of optimism to the uh to the picture here you know i the, uh, I, I learned to use the the sun and uh, take advantage of the benefits of the sun with southern exposure that and for building is it's lit up just the right way it, it does everything for a building same same thing here with emma till's house i mean we talk about this uh because there isn't uh, a, a moving live person here, but there are these, you did capture the presence of Emmett and his mother, Mamie, uh, in, with these images in the window. So talk about how you, I think, waited around a really long time for this shot and cursing me like, Cayman, why did you make, why did, why did you put me through this? Like, weren't you waiting for like, I don't know, something like, an hour or two hours or uh, I think I think yeah 45 minutes or an hour and, and actually I drove and came back so I think it all all in all it may have been an hour to get um I wanted someone walking by the building because I figured they would look at the building much like the bicyclists did right mm -hmm. and I wanted to get someone walking by the building to look at the looking at to look at the uh figures of the of the building um but you know uh you know tough to do in Woodlawn and many parts of the south side where you know, there just isn't the population, you know, uh, number uh, to uh, depend on a constant stream of, 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 of people. Although there were people behind me who were watching me take the photograph uh -huh. um, and talk to, but no one, no one walking from the house. Then it, then it hits me that, you know, I, I kind of use the same angle, but just in reverse as I did with the um, Laramie State Bank building, where there is something dynamic about the angle uh, that's there. Uh -huh. uh, you know, the building is essentially looking to your left while Mamie looks to your, looks to your right, Mrs. Till looks to your right, and of course Emmett, young Emmett looks straight ahead. But there was just something there, and I just sort of filled around with it and filled around with it until I got until I got that. Um, do you want to talk about also the way that the the frame cap the, the way you framed it captures the vacant lot, and and the you know the vacant lot next door and the and the somewhat dilapidated building um, in the backdrop. Well, you know, it's funny because um, I, I really wanted that building there because I wanted to show that it was 
you know, it was a bit of a neighborhood and it wasn't like sitting out in the middle of the, of the, of the desert, but uh, uh, of a deserted area. That right. next door, um, I think there 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 there's there are plans for it. Uh, so, uh, but they weren't they weren't developed uh, at the time I took the photograph. So, just wanted to give a little hint of, of what's there, and, and of course they guard in the front, and that there's a house next to it. Uh, didn't want to show the whole house. I want to focus. Yeah, on, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, just those details add so much. You know, like a conventional real estate shot would have been head on, or yeah. you know, dumb light. And, you know, you, but you're telling a story with these images, um, you know, that, that just goes way, way, way beyond, you know, what some hack photographer like me would have done, you know, just by shooting the building head on. Um, Thank you. Yeah, very, very much. That it, ha it has a context uh, around it, a neighborhood context around it. I want to be able to give a taste of it along with giving the full, uh, you know, uh, image of the of the of the building's facade, and this is and this I should mention is the image that's on the back cover of the book um, right. with the blurbs over it. Um, so again, you know that emphasizes the book's theme of of uh, the the tale of two cities that Chicago has become, with the glamorous city of the Bean on the cover, right. and then this other city um, uh, seemingly struggling um or struggling in, in cases but also rife with potential uh, as this as this is and then yeah go ahead i mean uh let's let's look at another south side uh uh landmark uh famously monumental uh the the roby house of course and tell us um what your approach was on this one lee you know here you have this classic house everyone that everyone knows um, you know, the, the, the deal here was to wait, um, obviously, until the, the sun was in a spot that I liked. So I wanted the sun to light up that long elevation uh, uh, on the east, on the south side of the house. But there's also tours there, right? So I wanted to give a sense that, that people are showing it there. I think one of the first images that I submitted to you got to you in the press, that tour group is closer. It, it's right. my, where that planter is, that, uh, you know, to the left, to the right there. Mm -hmm. um, but but um, you guys went one that was where the tour guides, the tour guides, the, the tour guide wasn't so prominent, and I think that was the right, the right choice because you notice the building first in its beauty and its totality, and then, um, and and then the guy. It's a tough building. It's very long. You know, when you see images of it, particularly some of the classic images that I think Richard Nickel took in the '60s, he he actually it's, it's two combined shots taken from directly across the oh, screen right. huh. and, uh, because it, it's that long. Uh, I managed, though, in this to give it all in one shot, not with this, not with this one, but with a shot that I didn't submit. I managed what, to the I'm entire sorry. animation in one shot, but there are cars in front of it, so it, it didn't work out as well. What camera did you use for this, this and other shots in the building? Uh, photo, uh, photo, I have uh, a, I photo I had, groups will want to know. I, I thought I had it close to me. It's, it's a Canon D, um, uh, D5, DS, DS, DS5. I may have the numbers transposed uh, that I bought years ago, but the but the real hero of this story is if you can see it is this wide angle. It's this wide angle lens. It kind of has a bulb. Oh, it's, it's not disappearing on me. Sorry about that. It kind of has this bulb for a lens, which allows you to get really wide shots. It's also um, perspective correcting lens, so. You um, you you can you can make sure that the angles are all straight uh, in the photographs. The only thing is, it's a manual lens, and I'm nearsighted, so you have to fiddle around with this thing for for quite a bit to get it going. But once you get it set, uh, it, it it does its thing. It's perfect for architecture because it makes the the lines line up as as, as best as best they can, you know as best as you can get them. Yeah, I love this shot. I mean, I think it um, you know it it captures the just the overall beauty of the Roby house. And also it's so crisp with the, the details. I mean, you can even sense the way that, you know, the horizontality of the Roman brick yeah. uh, that Wright used to emphasize, you know, the horizontal lines. Um, and just the way also, again, the, um, the foliage, um, you know, animates the facade. So it isn't this kind of sterile, uh, sterile thing. Uh, you really sense the way that the house um, 
is a like like the Farnsworth House, a viewing platform for nature. Uh, you know, who wouldn't want to be in that room right underneath that flying wing of a of a uh, facade, right? You know that that where that uh, the windows come to that point there in the uh, in the foreground. It's, it's wonderful, really wonderful. Um, anything else you got up your sleeve? Maybe maybe a couple more. Of course, uh, State of uh, War Thompson Center building. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the exterior that we all know, but um, but here's the interior, um, which is really where the magic is, I, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, this building, um, you know, is so star-crossed. Uh, and I think um, it's it, too, is part of the changing face of historic preservation. I mean, for so many years, architects were running away from the postmodern plague, as it was called. <laughs> um, and this was kind of exhibit A, particularly the uh, the exterior of the Thompson Center, which, uh, you know, the curtain wall is not exactly uh, Helmut's finest work, even though it looks a lot better in black and white than in color. Not, none of that robin's egg um, blue and, the you know, the salmon. But the interior really is a noble public space. And, um, you know, and you've captured so well the um, the way that it serves as a kind of indoor plaza. Can can you just going beyond that um, description of it? Can you tell us why you picked this particular angle and what you're trying to show? Uh, well, you know, you know, a couple of things. You know, obviously the two levels there to the to the to the lobby. You can see the uh, the state guard. Uh, I wanted him to stand in the right, directly in the middle of that. Kind of circle there. This thing is in a way. Uh, yeah, well, well. I get them close enough. But but what I do like about this is that you know it's uh you know for all the architectural stories we can tell about it, you know it's really a work a day building. You know, look 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 at the look what's inside. I mean, we know that there's a Sabaro and a food court down below. But you know there's a Sprint store. There's a GNC uh, uh, place. There's a Supercuts in in there. And then there's a Richard Hunt sculpture right to the left there. Can you see it uh, by the two uh, on the second? The second floor of, above. Oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, I mean, and, and, and it's just this kind of hodgepodge, and, and it's, and it, but a beautiful mess, you know, if if you will. There's a there's a credit union up there. I mean, it's all kinds of things, um, all all put together, and it, and it belongs to us. It's a city space, and um, you know, at the time that I took this photograph, you know, I was fearing that it would be lost, you know, totally lost. And right. so, um, but yeah, yeah, just show the architecture, but also show that. It's very much a Chicago building. That those that lineup there, minus the Richard Hunt sculpture, maybe even with it, that could be. You can find those stores grouped together at 79th and Exchange or Howard and Clark. You know what I mean? And, and here it is in the middle of downtown. Yeah, and the architecture dignifies both those stores and the people who are going through that public space. And I mean, the images like this were essential because they. So many people love to dump on the Thompson Center because of the curtain wall uh, being as uh, unattractive as it is, and also because of the heating and cooling problems that the building initially experienced. Um, but I mean, these um, images, images like this and columns by me, you, and others, I think helped make the case that this building should be saved. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's one of the um, one of the postscripts in the book deals with the decision by uh, Governor Pritzker to flip his stance on the building. He was initially ready to you know sell it off to a developer who would tear it down. Um, and one of the points here, I think, is this goes to the need for what I have always called activist criticism, the idea that you wouldn't just wait until things happen when it's too late, but rather you would, in certain cases, try to influence the action, um, you know, while there was still time for the right thing to happen. It's what you did in your editorials on the red line extension, and it's what, you know, the column I have uh, in the book, going back, I think, all the way to 2015, uh, you know, did in saying, hey, Governor Rauner, you know, hands off of this building. Don't try to just sell it off for a quick buck. 
this is a, a really distinguished work of postmodern architecture. And, um, you know, I'm proud that I took that stand because I think it was ratified in the long term um, by uh, the decision ultimately to save this building. Um, so again, I mean, I think that, you know, this is something that we have done in Chicago, you know, with these activist stands, um, trying to use the fourth estate, the free press to influence public dialogue. And, and every so often, if we're lucky, the outcome of, of public dialogue. And in this case, we do have a, not necessarily a happy ending because Google's going to, uh, Google has bought the Thompson Center. We don't know how they're going to treat this public space and they close off access to it and try to just make it a Google campus. Uh, I have a hunch that hell will be raised uh, by many people because this was the reason, one of the key reasons that preservationists argued, you know, for saving the Thompson Center, uh, that this this public space. So we'll see how it all turns out. But I think you've really communicated again, once again, the essence of why this is a, a building worth saving. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the Sun-Times uh, reversed its editorial decision on this building. Before I got there, it thought that selling it off was a good idea. And after I became an editorial board member, came, uh, you know, returned to the paper, uh, it mysteriously changed its its, uh, its tune on that. So uh -huh. I'm, so glad, I'm glad to see. Oh, now we're going from, well, now we're going to my old uh, uh, neck of the, my old place of employment, a rather grandiose neo-Gothic skyscraper, uh, Tribune Tower, of course. And uh, thank you for not dumping on Tribune Tower. I know that like, you know, as a Sun-Times guy, you'd probably try to shoot it like from a really bad angle with, you know, clouds and fog obscuring all of the Gothic decoration. You you really showed great restraint here, uh, I have to, uh, have to admit. Why well, thank you. thank you and you know it's probably you know because we're also in the same club now you know my 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 first home at the Sun Times is gone and yeah. second and third for that matter uh, is are, are gone and and uh, you know you uh, you kind of hate to see it's happening all across the the nation has happened all across the nation you know these are uh, these great newspaper buildings which were you know much like Cook County Hospital really where, where the architecture was a statement uh, to what the owners thought of what was being produced. In this place, and and the um, uh, and the importance of it, and you see it, uh, you know, and you see this this happening, and it just you know just kind of breaks the heart, you know, uh, a bit. So I kind of wanted to show it here. I mean, luckily the clock, the calendar helped, where it's in transition, right? Right. Um, it's not done. Uh, it isn't what it's going to be, and it isn't what it was. Uh, it's kind of in, in, in transition, and you know, it isn't being demolished like my building was sometimes building. Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, I had to, you know, had to, had to bring that one along too. too. I really like this shot because it emphasizes so well the vertical lines of the Tribune Tower that ascend to those flying buttresses. And, um, it also captures in the foreground, um, viewers may notice both the, one of the bridge tender houses of the DuSable Michigan Avenue Bridge on the left and also interestingly enough the um uh, the roof of the apple store yeah. uh, and i do think that's telling because here we have this building that was a monument to newspapers and the power of the press the printing press that you know printed it printed like millions of newspapers and in the foreground is this little structure that disrupted it represents the technology that totally disrupted the business model mm -hmm. of the newspapers the grand powerful newspapers like yours and mine uh you know apple and the web coming up with like the printing press of the 21st century which is you know the internet uh and therefore blowing up the business model that you know, led to the creation of grandiose structures like the Tribune Tower. Um, and, and that's where the book ends. Um, there are two essays about um, the Tribune and first of all, leaving Tribune Tower. And second of all, my reflections at the end of 28 years. 
And again, I try to tie them together thematically by saying that, you know, newspapers um, in their glory days could achieve uh, tremendous works of architecture like the Tribune Tower. And they could also build architectural dialogue in a city through um, the hiring of architecture critics. And those include our beloved predecessors, Paul Gap at the Chicago Tribune, M.W. Newman uh, at the Chicago Sun-Times, people whose shoulders we stand on and whose words we have relied on heavily uh, as we rifle through the clip files and look for yeah. appropriate ways to describe the buildings from the days of yore. Um, and it's, you know, and, and so... Um, that's, you know, I think a, a wonderful way to kind of conclude our own dialogue today. Um, I'm just glad that, um, you know, I was able to write a postscript to the my final column in which I could say that the Sun-Times had asked you to return to the field um, and that, you know, at least that way we had somebody watchdogging the beat and holding the powerful accountable. And, um, you know, that's um, ultimately, I think what we share, I mean, we've talked about our, how we think that buildings should be judged by their effect on people, not just how they look, we care about equity. Ultimately, we, we're newspaper guys and we care about, um, uh, whether, however, information and criticism and commentary are delivered, whether it's on the web or in print, uh, we want that civic voice to be there. Um, yes, I mean it's we we, we do, and, and um, you know, and I hope that the Tribune finds a way to well, you can't be replaced, but finds a way to uh, to bring the beat alive again. Uh, I hope the Tribune does. I mean, because having two critics. And the same town was unique. We did it back in the '90s, and I think that uh, if there's any town that can support two critics, you know, it's it's it's, it's Chicago. Yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, but as as we talked before, you know, you look at the future. You know, I'm you know I was 35 when I was when I first got named architecture critic, and then left at 39 or something like that. And I come back, and now I'm 50. Seven, I turned 57, turned 57 in October. So, you know, this isn't going to be something I'm doing for the next 20 years. And the question becomes, um, you know, does this become something that, um, you know, I can pass this off to a successor to uh, yeah. in some way? I don't know the answer to that, but until that day comes, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on it at least. Yeah. And in the meantime, I mean, I think that the book, um, tries to sum up as, you know, the last 10 years and also make the case through the articles and the way they're organized and the postscripts, the case for architecture criticism. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really the the core of, of what's, you know, going on here. Um, one thing I'd just like to point out, um, the book has, um, it's interesting, it doesn't look heavy, um, but it is heavy and um, surprisingly heavy. And that's because I insisted that the paper stock um, be glossy. So mm -hmm. these photographs would pop out and be shown to their best advantage. Uh, I'm really happy to say that the University of Chicago Press, the publisher, um, appreciated that. They spent the extra money to do that glossy paper and it you know it shows Lee's photographs um to to you know uh, to their best advantage sometimes as we know in newspapers with when photographs appear on newsprint they can kind of look muddy and they don't pop and uh but the advantage of a book is that it you know it, it has that uh glossy pop to it and really can make images jump and I think that's what that's what happens here so um Thank you so much, Lee. Thank um, you. Yeah, I know we're excited to take questions from uh, the viewers, and um, but Happy New Year, and uh, um, you know we'll look forward to talking uh, 
at greater length uh, prompted by the, the questions of, uh, of the audience. All right, I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. Thanks.